10 Treaties of the Vessels. I think that most of us love the idea of uncovering some kind of lost treasure. I for one would love to pull an Indiana Jones and uncover artifacts lost to the sands of time, but realistically you need a lot of clues in order to find these things. They could be anywhere. The world is quite a large place, you know. That's why ancient texts and documents are so important to researchers because sometimes they can give clues as to where some treasures might be. This is sort of the case with the Treaties of the Vessels. This ancient Hebrew text claims to reveal the location of where the treasures of King Solomon's temple are hidden. Well, sort of. The text discusses the location of the treasures as well as the fate of the Ark of the Covenant, which is a chest that is said to hold tablets engraved with the Ten Commandments. And as you would imagine, these are highly sought after, but no one knows where it is and the treaties of the vessels isn't really much help to researchers. The text says that the location of these things will quote, not be revealed until the day of the coming of the Messiah, son of David. So it just teases us with this mystery. We still have to wait to find these treasures. At number 9. Gospel of the Lots of Mary. Have you ever wished that you could know the future? Maybe you want to know how a relationship would play out, or if you should do something about your career, but you just need that little confirmation of future events to help you along. Well, if you lived in ancient times, then you might have sought out the Gospel of the Lots of Mary to help you with your needs. This ancient text is quite the gospel and dates back to around 1500 years. The Gospel of the Lots of Mary doesn't discuss the life of Jesus Christ, but instead contains contains 37 oracles that were written pretty vaguely. The original text was written in Coptic, an Egyptian language, and has been translated in modern times. The book opens with the words, quote, The Gospel of the Lots of Mary, the mother of the Lord Jesus Christ, she to whom Gabriel the archangel brought the good news, he who will go forward with his whole heart will obtain what he seeks, only do not be of two minds. End quote. Researchers believe that this book would have been used for divination in an attempt to seek knowledge of the future. Someone in need of answers would seek out this book, ask a question, and then would have gone through a process that would randomly select one of the 37 oracles to give answers to said person's problem. Almost like how we read horoscopes, but much more mysterious. Before we carry on talking about these strange and mysterious texts, why not leave a big ol' thumbs up on this video if you are thoroughly entertained so far? And while you're at it, why not subscribe to the channel to see more videos like this one and join the hive. At number 8, Liber Lintius. This next ancient text almost counts as a hidden message because of where this text was found by researchers. The Liber Lintius is an ancient text written in Estrusian, a language that was used in Italy in ancient times. What makes this text so mysterious is the fact that it was found preserved in the wrappings of an Egyptian mummy that dates back around 2200 years. This ancient text meaning isn't exactly clear, partially because the Etrusian language isn't fully understood, but researchers believe that the written text on the mummy's wrappings are of a ritual calendar. More research is needed to fully decipher this mysterious text, but it's a really cool find nonetheless. Number 7. Sewer Goddess I love reading about ancient gods. It's my favorite topic. The Roman god of manure and fertilizer, for example. Where was that one in Hades? That would have been helpful. I would have beat that game in 8 minutes flat with him. The god of toilets. There's one we can't forget about either. Crepitus, okay? Every day we have to thank the god of toilets, right? If you haven't today, Go ahead and thank them. The Romans regarded Glossina as the goddess of the main drain. The literal main drain to the city of Rome. All this water. This goddess was Gloca Maximum, aka Big Drain. Eventually, this god was affiliated with Venus, the goddess of beauty and love. Yeah, love me some big ass drains. Nice. That's a lie, actually. As a kid, I was so afraid of the bathtub drain. I would pull it and then just immediately high jump out of the tub. I don't want to get sucked down like Ant-Man. Know what I mean? Number six, death before combat. With most of these Roman gladiators, they're trained, they understand a specific style of combat, and they're paired with an opponent that's somewhat equal. And then hundreds of people go, yeah, and they bet on you, and then see you blood and stuff. It's horrible. But not all these gladiators are UFC fighters, okay? Not all of them are Kurt Russell and handsome. No, a great amount of these gladiators were criminals who were forced to fight each other in the name of entertainment, or they were slaves. Yeah, these prisoners of war were not really on board with fighting a lion with a dagger, believe it or not. They understood this was a one-way trip, most likely, so many of them took their own lives before the combat even begun. This one story is quite haunting, but it makes total sense, sadly. 29 prisoners, they were all set to fight these crazy animal battles in front of thousands, but they all strangled each other. They all took each other's lives with their bare hands, because that was easier to them than walking into this nightmare 
publicly. That's horrible. The reason this was the easier choice to make, sadly, was because saying no to the combat or to the games would just lead to an even more painful public execution. So it's a lose-a-lose, -lose, sadly. They sucked. Number five, loincloths. Going back to ancient Roman and Egyptian times, here we go, two for one. The loincloth was of course used by all. Either that or you would just be naked. I found this neat step-by-step -step on how to make your own loincloth and I tried it and it's way more complicated than I could have ever imagined, okay? We don't have a lot of archaeological evidence because these linens barely made it through a decade, obviously. There's not a lot of bones in them that would hang out over these thousands of years. But ancient Romans would often use leather to make underwear. Can you imagine that? Hot goat skin wrapped around your waist in the sun? Oh, I need baby powder, just thinking about it right now. We still use leather today when it comes to undergarments and you know, zippers and stuff, but that's that's for another video. We'll get to that another time. Number four, cesspools. Hey, here's a note. If you're gonna make a massive castle, you need to know where not to build certain rooms. In case you're building a castle, anyone watching? Like say over a cesspool, as an example. Yeah, don't build anything heavy over here or else Let's talk about it. Cesspools were often placed under floors, which makes sense, because you know, gravity and life and stuff. But you need to make sure those floors are supportive enough, period, that's it. Or else, this will happen. Back in 1183, the emperor of the Holy Roman Empire had a dinner in the palace of Erfurt. But in the main floor of the main hall, broke open, resulting in a bunch of dinner guests falling through said floor, with even a few drowning again in said cesspool. Yeah, it's a horrible way to go. And then again, in 1326 in England, Richard the Raker had just sat down. The guy hasn't even started his meal yet, and then again, the floor beneath him broke and he fell through and drowned in a cesspool. That's like the worst way to drown too. I'd say chamber pots were safer, but when it comes to waste, out of sight, out of mind, sadly, just get that shit away from me, just downhill, Get it out, or else we'll drown in it, probably. Number three, Roman shampoo. Okay, when my hair grew out over the pandemic, I had a panic attack. I've never, I don't know what the f to do. I had a huge wake-up call. I've never had long hair before. I don't know what to use in this mop. I still don't, clearly, evidently. All I had growing up was the classic four-in-one shampoo for guys. That wasn't working out at all, that sucked. I needed some curl cream, okay, separate jars of items, not just a five in one with mouthwash on your head. That's, those aren't, those aren't good. Those don't do anyone any good. But the ancient Romans, they didn't have head and shoulders back then. What did they do? Well, sometimes nothing. They would dip their hair in cold water and at public bathhouses also, very public. Then they would rub and scrape away oils. Lime water was also used to wash your hair, but that was just as useful as lime wire. Sometimes Europeans wouldn't even use water at all to clean their head. They would rub their head with bran, like just a loose bran, before bed, and then they'd brush it out with a comb in the morning. Yeah, bran. I used dog shampoo once by accident. I thought that was bad. Bran? <laughs> Be so itchy, I wouldn't sleep a wink. Number two, ancient socks. Somebody got me socks over the holidays as a gift, and let me tell you, last year, I became a man. I was like, thank you, I actually love this. This is now the best gift of my life. Socks and lip balm? That's it, I don't want a PlayStation, get lost. Socks in ancient Greece, first of all, they weren't, you know, the ankle socks, they weren't Vans skateboarding socks, they weren't the weird grippy ones that kids have. Where were those growing up, first of all? Not even close. Socks came around in the eighth century BC and it was made fresh from animal hairs. This led to Romans tying animal skins around their feet and then, you know, tying it more and more and more and higher and higher. Anything to keep it there. Now cut to the second century AD in ancient Rome, the sock game finally got real. Romans began using fabrics instead of animal skins. It was now softer, it was lighter, and then later in the fifth century, socks were worn only by the most holy, which is kind of ironic because socks have holes in them. You get the joke, there it is. Socks were associated with the church. They were considered a symbol of purity. Socks would go all the way up your leg back then. Like I said, a little different than the uh, New Balance ankle socks we got today. A little less holy. Finally, number one, public bathhouse. This last one, okay, we haven't moved on from this at all. That's why I wanted to finish this list. Nice little fresh fun reminder from Taylor McWaters. Here we go. We still bathe together a lot. We go to water parks and we swim around in pools filled with pee. Ancient Roman bathhouses were the older, slightly yuckier versions of water parks. They would literally spread intestinal parasites. They were actually way worse. And these massive rooms with giant pools just lie disease, nude, there were dicks and everyone was sweaty and it was all tight and there was no filtration system. It was like an indoor hot tub without the pumps or the salts, it was gross. The Romans were literally figuring out sewage systems at the same time, which I of course mentioned earlier, but they were also the first to create heated public baths. Yeah, my above ground pool wasn't heated, but the ancient Romans, they had heated pools. Great, I gotta send an email to my dad this afternoon. Now I'm pissed. The archeology span and anthropology department at Cambridge discovered that Romans brought lots of parasites to Europe. Yeah, the fossilized feces showed that these heated, relaxing, rejuvenating bathhouses nearby were all but yeah, they were horrible. They were just spreading hot disease, coming in hot. I don't mean to undermine the ancient Romans. To be fair, they also 
brought with them lice and fleas. Ayo, this one for the road. Number 10, The Sins of Our Fathers. Law and Order is not just a hit drama from the 90s with a killer soundtrack, but something that started with the civilizations a very long time ago. King Hammurabi and his code of law comes to mind. But today, we're talking about ancient Persia. We're talking about a corrupt judge named Sisimans. After taking a bribe and delivering a not so unbiased verdict, the king found out and was most displeased. This is one of the worst things to do to another human being, but poor Sisimis was flayed. Or in simpler terms, they done skin that feather alive. To make an unholy situation even more uncomfortable, they made a chair and used his hide as a material and made his son sit in the flesh chair to make his own judgments. Can't help but think that you'd be sitting there all day thinking of dear old dad because you're sitting on top of a chair that's kind of fuzzy because dad had a lot of back hair. Yikes. Number nine, the annual purge. I don't know about you folks at home, but I love the holiday season. For me specifically, Christmas. And to me, the meaning of Christmas is something less to do with religious background, but just good cheer. Spending time with loved ones and friends and really enjoying a nice homemade meal. I mean, come on, turkey with a stuffing. <laughs> can't go wrong there. And honestly, you can't beat a good stuffing. I love it. But looking back at ancient Persia, there was a different kind of holiday. One that also has its roots in uh, less about religion and more about cold-blooded killings. There were Zoroastrian priests called the Magi, and although they weren't Persian, they were somewhat respected in Persian culture. But when a plot to overthrow the king was enacted, the Persians were not too happy and slaughtered the people responsible for the coup. But just for good measure, they also slaughtered all the other priests in the palace. Okay, but they might have missed some outside in the city and they had to get them too. You know what, how about every year on this day, we go on a Magi hunt? So it became a holiday. Every year on the day of the coup, there was a grand feast and then a hunt for the remaining survivors. That's really comforting, that's nice. Number eight, poaching. It's 2021, we all know it's super uncool to poach. Illegally hunting endangered species for fun or just one sought after piece of the animal like elephant tusks for ivory. Our Persian friends from the past just might have been partaking in the poaching of rhinos. While in the ancient world the laws of today were not around to protect animals, the reason was still there and people wanted horns. For some reason, however, people thought that rhino horn held the power to purify water. Thus, it was used to detect poisonous liquids. It's a superstitious belief that actually would be carried on for a very long time. Rhino horn did have other uses in civilizations, but I like to think it was a coolness factor. You can't tell me drinking wine out of a hollowed out horn isn't cool. Come on. At number seven, Gospel of Judas. Guys, we might have quite the plot twist on our hands, and it's all thanks to this mysterious ancient text. Researchers found a 3rd century text that they called the Gospel of Judas, and after being translated, might have revealed an alternate version of an event from the Bible. Originally written in Coptic, the Gospel of Judas seems to be a depiction of Judas Iscariot, the man who betrayed Jesus in the New Testament, in a positive light. In the New Testament, Judas was said to have betrayed Jesus by revealing his identity to those who had come to arrest him in exchange for 30 pieces of silver, but in the Gospel of Judas, it describes Jesus as asking Judas to betray him in order for him to be crucified so that he could ascend to heaven. This plot twist is debated among some people though, as other researchers have said that the text actually declares Judas as a demon. Either way, it's a new spin on the story that we didn't have before, and I'd say that's pretty darn mysterious. At number 6, Grolier Codex. Imagine owning something that you believe was just a piece of art, turn out to actually be an ancient artifact. This kind of thing is actually a lot more common than you'd think, since over the years, pillaging and looting of ancient sites have led to many artifacts being misplaced and sold around the world. This is the case with the Grolier Codex. The Grolier Codex is an ancient Mayan codex that contains Maya hieroglyphs, illustrations of gods, and a calendar that tracks the movement of Venus. Want to know where they found it? In a club in New York. The person who acquired the codex, a Mexican collector named Jose Sanez, said that he got it from a group of looters in the 1960s, and after a lot of debate, it was found that the codex that he had was in fact authentic. Researchers found that this ancient text was written on paper that dates back about 800 years and was written using paint known as Maya Blue, which actually wasn't synthesized in a lab until pretty recently. I think it's pretty crazy that this ancient text from the Maya civilization somehow ended up in New York and no one really noticed. At number 5, Popol Vuh. Just about every civilization has their interpretation of Earth's origins. Some cultures believe that cosmic beings made the Earth, others believed in various gods and various motivations for creating life. 
One ancient text that was discovered by researchers tells the story of the Maya and their belief of how the world was created. This ancient text known as Popol Vuh, which ultimately is translated to Book of Council, is a mythical origin story. According to the tales written in this ancient text, the forefather gods, quote, brought forth the earth from a watery void and endowed it with animals and plants, end quote. The text also describes how the gods had difficulties making humans and tells the story of how they created two humans hero twins who went on a series of adventures and even defeated the Lord of the Underworld. The earliest surviving copy of Popol Vuh dates back to 1701, but it is believed that there were earlier copies of the text that might not have been found or have been lost. At number 4, Copper Scroll. Next up, let's talk about another ancient text that discusses the existence of a large treasure. An ancient Hebrew text called the Copper Scroll was found in a cave in the Judean desert. This ancient text is believed to contain recorded details of a vast treasure that may include gold, silver, vessels, and coins. The Copper Scroll dates back to sometime around 7 BCE, which coincides with a time when the Roman army laid siege to Jerusalem and the Second Temple, a Jewish holy temple which stood on the Temple Mount in Jerusalem, was destroyed. Researchers are still unsure if these treasures described in the Copper Scroll actually exist, as it is still highly debated. Even if these treasures really did exist, it could have already been found back in ancient times, but even still, no treasure as large as the one described in the scroll have been found in Israel or Palestine. At number 3, Dresden Codex. For researchers, being able to find ancient texts is very exciting because it can teach them a lot about a civilization, its people, and their beliefs. However, they're often pretty hard to come by due to a number number of reasons like poor preservation, warfare, looting, and more. In the case of the Mayans, many of their artifacts and written documents were believed to have been destroyed by Christian missionaries trying to wipe out any non-Christian beliefs, so when one of their ancient texts is found, it's a pretty big deal. When the Dresden Codex was found, it was a huge accomplishment for researchers. The Dresden Codex is an ancient Mayan document that dates back 800 years and contains 39 sheets of text with beautifully drawn images and text on both sides. Researchers done on this codex indicate that it is a record of the phases of the planet Venus so that the Maya, quote, would be certain that their ceremonial events were being held on the correct day. End quote. The codex first appeared in Germany in 1730, but no one really knows how it got there. At number 2, Voynich Manuscript. Now this next ancient text is pretty mysterious simply because no one can read it. Dun dun dun! That's right, the Voynich Manuscript, a 250 page book containing illustrations of plants, cosmological symbols, and naked ladies, is carbon dated to have originated sometime in the 15th century. It also contains unreadable text. This book was first discovered in 1912 by an antique book dealer, and since then, the text in the book has yet to have been deciphered. There is speculation amongst researchers that suggests that perhaps the language in this book is a lost language or code or perhaps just gibberish. However, a recent study of the book's language suggests that it does have the hallmarks of a real language. You know what I think the Voynich manuscript is? An alien document. Think about it. Aliens came to Earth and they documented what they saw, like native plant species and humans, hence the drawings of women, because come on, how can you not be obsessed with women? Right? And these cosmological symbols found in the book would also be tied to the aliens because of course, they're from outer space. But what do you guys think? And finally, at number one, Handbook of Ritual Power. Saving the best and most mysterious ancient text for last, we have the Handbook of Ritual Power. This is a 20 page ancient codex that dates back around 1300 years and is written in Coptic. What's so interesting and mysterious about this little book is its contents. Within the 20 pages of this ancient book are magic spells and formulas, including love spells, spells for curing black jaundice, and even instructions on how to perform an exorcism. It's believed that this ancient text may have been written by a group of Sethians, an ancient Christian sect who praised Seth, the third son of Adam and Eve. What adds to the already mysterious contents of the book is the book's opening, as it references a mysterious unknown figure named Bactiotha. A translation of the opening text of the handbook reads, quote, I give thanks to you and I call upon you the Bactiotha, the great one who is very trustworthy, the one who is lord over the forty and the nine kinds of serpents. End quote. The book is now housed in a museum in Sydney after they purchased it from an antiquities dealer in Vienna. How this dealer acquired the book though remains unknown. Kicking off the list at number 10, the bird. The bird is not the word. It's actually pretty offensive. To flip somebody the bird or to flip somebody off, of course, means to give them the middle finger. One of these little troublesome guys right here, one of these blurry dudes right here. 
Do we even know why we do this? I mean, I don't recommend it because obviously you'll get in a heap of trouble from whoever's on the other end, the receiving end of said finger. But giving somebody the middle finger comes from the fourth century BC in Athens. The philosopher Dino Genes expressed how he felt visitors about Demosthenes. He described him by making a, well, you guessed it, a middle finger. It's a phallic gesture. The middle finger is supposed to be your, you know, the, the your bird, for lack of a better term. And the surrounding curled fingers are meant to be the you know, the other things that are around said thing on the body. I'm trying not to say what I really want to say here, but the bird is meant to, you know, it's supposed to be one of those. The more you know, ancient Greek history, who would have thunk? Number nine, column wars. While the Greeks were going head to head with the Turks, they were fighting over their independence, of course, and the Greeks had the upper hand at Acropolis one day. They were surrounding their enemy and they had this stronghold in their grasp, and the Turks at the same time were running out of ammo and options. They then began to break apart the marble columns around them, just smashing them to pieces, just breaking them as fast as they can to try and get lead from inside and use that as ammo. Now, as the Greeks witnessed the destruction of their Parthenon, they panicked, obviously. They said, here, just take ammo instead. Whatever you do, just don't break those columns. We can keep fighting. In fact, we'll supply you the ammunition. Just don't break those columns. And they did. 1821 Greek War of Independence. Here you go, Ottoman Empire. Take this lead. Now we can fight. Let's do it. It's like when you're at a house party, they're like, just fight each other. Just don't put a hole in the wall. I'll be grounded. Seriously. I can't fix that. I don't know how to. Number eight, zombies. It doesn't matter what the context is. Zombies are always scary. Whenever we talk about ancient Egyptians, we break down the process of mummification. And you know what? I'll be honest, I missed that part. Just keep everything in jars. Keep everything separate in different rooms. Keep everything safe, surrounded by treasure in the middle of a tomb. No zombie is coming back to life if that's the case. You know what I mean? Well, ancient Greeks actually believed in zombies as well. They had steps they would take to prevent the dead from ever walking again. Archaeologists found graves where bodies were weighed down with rocks, or they would be pinned to their tombs. One of the two. Both pretty horrible. They weren't called zombies, of course, but rather revenants. Reanimated corpses that return to terrorize the living. AKA zombies. It's a zombie. Dr. Solowski Weaver explains that bodies found at a cemetery near the ancient town of Camarina in southeast Sicily were feared to come back to life at one point. The town was once a Greek colony, of course now modern day Italy, but it's home to a third century cemetery with around 3,000 bodies in there. There's more than half of them that are buried with coins, the usual, but a few of them were found in specific ways, peculiar ways. One body found in tomb 653, their body was covered in large fragments of amphora. So it's whatever it was underneath there, they didn't want that to move. Which is weird, because you're like, okay, I know that they're dead. Why are we putting a rock on them? You know, that, that fear, we still have it today. Number seven, Marvin's room. Hey man, it's okay. We've all been there. We all felt that kind of hurt before. You're drunk, it's 3 a.m. In a big city with lights. She hurt you bad, dude. But you should just call her. Just see if she picks up. Maybe you shouldn't. Maybe you should get really drunk and then come up with a solution and then see if it still sounds like a solid plan in the morning when you're sober. Yeah, when ancient Persians had a big decision to make, they used dad wisdom. Get super drunk and then think about critical events in life that require tough decision making. And when you're sober in the morning, do it drunk you thought. Being honest was a big part of Persian culture. And when are people at their most honest? So the theory kind of makes sense to me. I just know that when I wake up in the morning after nurturing a case of beer, that last night's thoughts don't always translate well in the morning. Number six, the land of milk and honey. Another creative punishment for the people who want to lose sleep tonight, a punishment for crimes Persians had come up with was scapism. This is where the Persians would feed a convicted criminal milk and honey. Sounds awesome, right? Well, not exactly. See, they entrapped the person between two boats, and every day they would force feed someone milk and honey. Milk and honey, milk and honey. Over and over and over again. Also, slathering the mixture of the two on the poor helpless criminal. As time went on, flies and bugs would find themselves interested in a sweet smelling crook. As one must also use the bathroom after all that beautiful rich consumption. A true horror to see, but after enough time, the person who was unlucky enough to be in such a position slowly and painfully died in a bog of their own filth and rodent infested area. Most likely dying of septic shock. I don't even even have a joke for this one. This is something that should just be in the next Saw movie. Ugh. Number five, ashes to ashes. Here's another fun punishment. Man, these guys are really creative. This one is mentioned in the Bible, so you know it's gonna be good. Basically, the Persians built a tower, and it was filled with ash. Drop criminals into the ash tower, 
or there were two large paddles connected to the turning wheels outside that would churn the ash and victim inside, suffocating on the hot ash. Making for a hot and dusty storm of hell and unholy foulness I can't even begin to describe. Like most things in history from this time, it has to be taken with a grain of salt. It could be very true or not so true. As the Persian Empire did not leave us with much, and most knowledge of them comes from Greeks and Greek historians. But like most stories, there's truth in everything. And if that's even close to the truth, well, that's just not right, man. Number four, this is Sparta. Despite what a 2006 movie with spray on abs might mislead you, the Battle of Thermopylae was no laughing matter. It pitted the very brave Spartans against the Persian invaders. And there were a lot of them. Like, really a lot of them. Attack after attack after attack, the Persians were not getting anywhere. It wasn't until one of the Greeks betrayed the Spartans by leaving the Persians on a flank that would result in the destruction of the Spartans. Although the Persians were victorious, it was in a sense a pyrrhic victory, as the loss of life on the Persian side far outnumbered the deaths of the Spartans. It's a battle that would be remembered for its bravery, and enough to have a movie made about it many, many years later. Number three. Here comes the boy. So after a failed attack on Greece, Persia was kinda down about that. No money in the treasury meant that the once great Persian empire was on the decline. So what better time to invade? And that's just what Alexander the Great did. Through a very lengthy campaign that lasted 10 years and a very formidable fighting force, most likely the strongest ever at the time, he shattered the declining Persian empire. He even managed to capture the city of Babylon. Talk about kicking a guy while he's down. His rule of the Persian Empire unfortunately was short lived, as he died not too long after that at the ripe old age of 32. Boy, I sure hope I lived to the ripe age of 32. Number two, the protection of Meow. Before the Persian Empire was no more, they were actually a very powerful empire. So powerful that they wanted a piece of Egypt. This war may have also been started by an insult from the pharaoh, but expanding was probably more likely. What makes this war so notable is the absolute five head play by Persia. Persia knew of the Egyptian culture and knew about their idolization of cats. So, to aid them in the invasion, the king advised them to use kitty power. Soldiers were painting cats in the god Bastet in order for Egyptians to not dare destroy an image of their god. More ridiculous than that was the use of live cats. Stray cats were rounded up and kept during battle in order to prevent the very lethal arrow fire. Soldiers still died in battle, but it is said that the cats gave enough of an advantage for there to be a Persian victory. Decent. Number one, progressive for the time. Looking back in time, we can all acknowledge that maybe we weren't so nice. And as time has moved on, we've gotten more progressive. When you think of ancient empires, you don't really think of progressive, but surprisingly Persia was for the time. Specifically women's rights. Women were free to move about. They were allowed to work and be higher ups and manage. But probably the most important aspect was the right to own business and property, which their European counterparts simply could not do. Look at you, Asian Persia, way to go, look at you. At number 10, dental modification. When thinking about types of body modification, you might not always think of dental work falling under that category, because really, who just thinks about teeth on a daily basis other than dentists, right? No one is really thinking too hard about those bones in our mouths, but dental modification is a thing and has been for many, many years. Though nowadays we see modifications with braces, tooth gems, and the occasional grill, back in ancient times, people were also modifying and decorating their pearly whites. For example, in the 7th century BC, Etruscan women would wear flat gold bands around their teeth as a way to both decorate and keep them in place. In Mesoamerica, some people would file their teeth using stone tools to carve their teeth into different shapes. They would also drill holes into their teeth and insert small stones and minerals like jade and iron pyrite into them. Vikings were also known to modify their teeth by carving horizontal grooves into them and sometimes filling the grooves with red dye as a way to make them look more fearsome. As if they needed to, right? I mean, they were Vikings. They were fearsome enough as it is. Though many of these practices have since been discontinued, so to speak, there are still people out there who we know would definitely try some of these ancient practices out. At number 9, foot binding. Foot binding was a body modification practice in China that began in the 10th century AD. This whole trend started because a court dancer bound her feet and the emperor at the time, Emperor Li Yu, liked what he saw. Soon this practice of foot binding became a huge trend and it became associated with being able to find a husband. The practice of foot binding began when a girl was 5 or 6 years old. They would have her feet be in hot water, have her nails cut short, and have their skin rubbed with oil before having their four smallest toes broken, folded over, and tied down. 
Then their feet would be bent in the middle to break the arch, and the girl would have to walk around like that over time, crushing the heel and sole of the foot. After about two years, the foot would be considered ready, and depending on the size of the girl's foot by the end, this would judge how easily she would be able to be matched with a good husband. This practice continued all the way until the 20th century. Now before I carry on telling you guys about weird ways people modified their bodies, let me first ask you to leave a like on this video if you're liking what you see so far, and also maybe consider subscribing while you're at it, so come join the Bumblebee family. At number 8, Scarification. Scarification is the practice of cutting, burning, or slicing the skin to create raised scars that are seen as decorations on the body. The practice of scarification dates back quite a while, with the earliest evidence of this body modification dating back to 8000 BCE, where figurines of fertility goddesses were found with the appearance of scars along their bodies. Scarification could date back even further than that, but since skin is very rarely preserved, we may never know. Evidence of scarification have been found in cultures in Africa, as well as Australia, New Zealand, Papua New Guinea, North, South, and Central America. Depending on the specific culture, there were a number of reasons behind the presence of scarification in their culture. Some people did it to show status or wealth, others did it for cosmetic purposes, others did it as a rite of passage, and some did it to show how well they could handle pain. In many cultures, scarification is still present, and honestly, I think it's pretty beautiful. Number seven, stone cold. When the pandemic first began, one of the hardest things to get a hold of, surprisingly, was toilet paper. Yeah, it's pretty important. It's more important than we realized because that was the thing on the news that we saw. People just boxing each other at a Walmart for toilet paper. When you run out of toilet paper, you often remember that moment regardless of where you are forever. Leaves of three, let them be. That's all I'm saying. But ancient Greeks used these small ceramic pieces to wipe. Yeah, ceramic pieces, like sharp. French anthropologist Philippe Charlier expands on this toilet hygiene history in the British Medical Journal. It was these flat terracotta discs found in these ancient sites, and they had residue on them, so the proof's in the pudding. They also discovered a Greek cup which said, three stones are enough to wipe one's arse. Three stones. See, even today, it's like three pieces, you know, three slices, three stones. It's always three. Yeah, Greeks would use pebbles to wipe their butts. Never take the go for granted ever again. Number six, naked exercise. Okay, this one, honestly, I'm just saying it's unusual, but I'm on board with it. You ever forget a towel when you're showering? You gotta do that weird naked silly run through the hallway. I'll be honest with you guys, that's my favorite run. I feel like one of those aliens from Signs, just walking around all light, naked, and lanky. Just meant for speed, you know, meant for greatness. Just wet, just like a lizard, just slipping around all over the kitchen. Ancient Greeks used to work out naked. The word gymnasium translates to the Greek term gymnasion, which meant school for naked exercise. Yeah, growing up, I always wanted to go to Xavier's school for gifted youngsters. Now, I just want to go to Ezekiel's school for naked exercise. Just don't set up shop behind the guy working on his squats. That's probably a bad idea. You know what? The more I think of this, the more I convince myself it's a pretty terrible idea. Hey man, do you mind spotting me? Sure. Number five, wine time. When we think of ancient Greeks, we think of wine and parties and apparently naked exercise, right? But was it really a drunken festival of love all the time? I mean, hangovers are a thing, right? We need some recovery days. When did Gatorade get invented? I don't know, this is it's probably hard to keep up. Ancient Greeks actually rarely drank wine without diluting the hell out of it first. To water the wine, the ratio was four to one or five to two. Either way, it's, it's just water at that point. So you'll be hydrated, that's for sure, which is great, but you're not really getting drunk, so I don't know what the point was. Regular Joes would drink at taverns, and the rich would throw house parties, so some things, of course, have stayed the same after all these years, but ancient Greeks believed that drinking undiluted wine could cause blindness or insanity. My friend, I think that's just called blacking out. I don't know. Who knows? If you did happen to drink too much wine, the 4th century poet Amphis, he's got you back. Best way to cure those ancient hangovers was to boil some cabbage. Nice. Just what you want to smell after a night out. And in order to keep the party going without embarrassing yourself off some sparkling Shiraz, the best way to party and stay sober was to bake and eat a pig's lung. That's the trick to never getting drunk in ancient Greek times. Again though, I think that was just eating food. I think eating food helps before you drink. Either way, if you're gonna drink, do so responsibly. Eat some pig lung and then you'll be good. Number four, bronze bowl. On a list of unusual things ancient Greeks did, I think it's fair to throw in the bronze or the brazen bull. There was a bronze sculpture, often in the shape of a bull. Yeah, obviously. Usually it was large enough to fit a person inside. Yeah, it's, I think I saw this in a Saw movie one time. That's how, you know it's, that's how you know it's good. Once the person was locked inside, a fire would then be set underneath this bronze bowl, and then you could probably figure out the rest of that situation and what happens to the victim inside. We'll say victim inside, not person. Victim. Horrible, horribly, painfully 
It's, it's all bad. They engineered the bull so that when somebody screamed inside, it sounded like a bull's roar. <laughs> That's haunting. That's actually really horrible. Every time I talk about this, I'm like, mm, this is real life. Real people did this. It was designed originally for Phalaris. He was a horrible ruler. He ruled around 560 BC, but the sculpture for Phalaris was built by Perilous, the guy who made the brazen bull. He was sadly the first victim. That's why you don't make torture devices. I don't know. Number three, Greek statues. Okay, I'll lighten up the mood a little bit. The last one was a bit dark. We've all done this at one point. Maybe you're at a museum and you see a statue. It's right there in front of you. It's carved. It's pure beauty. It's massive. The warrior represented has like 15 abs. It's made of bronze, eight feet tall. The amount of detail gone into their body is jaw dropping. Truly, it's impressive. But did you know that ancient Greeks would make their their, their bird uh, small on purpose? Uh? On purpose. Yeah, men who were well endowed were more often than not fools. They were foolish. Only They only ruled for lust, right? They were just craved fools with big birds. If you had a big brain, however, oh, you were the talk of the town. Ladies would whisper about you when you pass by in the street. Did you hear about Brian's big brain? Oh my God. He's got his dad's brain. Whenever an actor would play a fool on stage, they would be given a comedically large uh, setup. You know, that's how you know he's the villain or the fool, the bad guy in the scenario. The way we see these statues today meant that they had self-control and intelligence. I always thought they were just in a cold room when they were getting their stuff carved, but that's what this channel's for. History, but make it a little silly. Number two, the Battle of Marathon. Every New Year's, there's always that one guy on Facebook or Instagram who just becomes a runner just overnight. Just, they have a little squirt water belt thing that they, they shoot it, you know, the whole thing, the whole setup, and they train ideally for a marathon. That's the big thing that they talk about for an entire year, this marathon. What is a marathon? Was it a person or is it just a name for 42 kilometers? Well, it was actually a battle back in 490 BC. That's how it kicked off. Between ancient Greeks and Persian invaders sent by King Darius, the Persians arrived to Marathon, there was about 20,000 of them, and they arrived to punish the Greeks for supporting the Lonians, who revolted against the Persians. Now the Greeks were outnumbered here at this point, but they attacked hard and they attacked fast. They took out 6,000 Persians and eventually they just fled the scene entirely. The number of Greek fighters lost was around 200, so far less casualties. The story of Finipides came to be at this time. He ran the first ever marathon. He ran all the way from Marathon to Athens to deliver messages because Blackberry wasn't a thing, obviously. So some guys had to be like, you bet. <laughs> Imagine servers back then, they're like, would you want a large soda? You got. He was one of the Greek military men known as day long runners. He did six marathons back to back. My knees hurt just saying that, you know what I mean? So next time you see somebody on Facebook become a marathon runner, just post a link to this video and be like, you got it. You're almost, just do six in a row and you're good. Also do six in a row naked in the heat and you're good. And finally, number one, human sacrifice. Of course, we got to end on something crazy like this. We found the remains of a 3000 year old skeleton in Greece. They found the skeleton on the side of Mount Lycaon, which historians know as the site of animal sacrifice for Zeus. I don't know why I pointed up, but probably not down or yeah, Zeus, he's up there, yeah. Ancient writers mentioned this site and how human sacrifice was also at play here. And now thanks to technology, we can confirm that this was for sure the case. We talked about zombies earlier and how bodies would be buried with like rocks in them and stuff. This is a bit different. This is actually much different. The upper part of the skull that was found was missing, first of all, and the body was laid on two lines of stones with stone slaps just laid on their pelvis. Now Greece, of course, is the birthplace of philosophy and democracy and all that good stuff, but they also did some sacrificial shady stuff in their off time as well when they weren't slamming water down Merlot. Science allowed us to look all over the world too, not just Greece. There's ancient Egyptians, Aztecs, sometimes after Mayan ball games, the losing team would be sacrificed. Yeah, that's pretty brutal. Everyone talks about how awful humans are now. Well, we've always been the worst. The Greeks just like to party while they were doing it. Kicking off the list at number 10, the ring of Sekinianus. One ring to rule them all. And by rule, I mean curse you and your entire family for ages to come. Yeah, this 12 gram gold ring for starters was massive. It was beautiful. Its diameter was 25 millimeters. So unless you were wearing some mighty gauntlet, she might slip off. Big old ring. It's like a big onion ring, but a little bit, a little bit more haunting. The ring had first been found in 1785. A farmer was plowing a field in Silchester Village, which is a village west of London, known for its, you know, grim history, as are most of these things on this list. In 45 AD, ancient Romans invaded that site, and come the seventh century, it was completely abandoned. No one was left there. The ring was mighty. It had an inscription on it as well, a Latin inscription. Of course, always Latin. It read, Senecion vivas in diem. When 1929 rolled around, new details surfaced, or resurfaced, rather. The 
data from the ring matched an excavation that was done in the early 1900s, less than 100 miles away, a place called Lindney. That's where this ring is from. That's the OG. That's the OG site. At the same site, however, a tablet was found recalling the Celtic god of healing and hunting and how his favorite gold ring was stolen. In case you're wondering why this rings a bell, Lord of the Rings was inspired by this legend. The tablet also says, may he who bears the name of Senechianus not have health until he brings the ring back to the Temple of Nodens. So, if you've got it, let's go. Number nine, the Crystal Skull. Honestly, I'm surprised we haven't talked about this more. A lot of Mesoamerican stuff today, but damn, they got a lot of curses and jinxes on all their stuff. And in reality, that's not fair. All a guy wants to do is loot and pillage other civilizations' treasures, just like my ancestors before me. Nice. Maybe. Well, besides being the second worst Indiana Jones movie, yeah, I said it, I like that one better than the Temple of Doom. Now, if you didn't sit through an hour of Shia LaBeouf, and honestly, I don't blame you, basically the skulls are like a Pokemon or Dragon Balls. You gotta, you gotta catch them all. Only then, you will receive a wish where a ghostly outworldish creature will grant you said wish. In other words, this is what a weekend at Vanessa's Hudgens house looks like. I don't know, she said she can talk to ghosts, so. The only ghouls that she's talking to are the people who think High School Musical holds up as a theatrical release. Seriously, try watching that movie now without cringing yourself into the bottom of a liquor bottle. Speaking of ghosts and liquor, you can buy alcohol in the shape of a crystal skull, because we are modern humans and we don't take ancient warnings very seriously. We will probably feel the wrath of the crystal skull, all thanks to a Canadian Ghostbuster. Number eight, Pompeii artifacts. Once a thriving, beautiful city in ancient Rome, Pompeii was sadly destroyed in 79 AD. This time, it wasn't humans responsible for the massive loss of life. What do you know? It was actually Mother Nature this time around. Hmm, she got one. Nice. The eruption of Vesuvius buried the ancient city in volcanic ash. Thank you, it took nine tries. Little do you know, viewer. Excavation didn't begin until much later, during the 18th century, and after a century of careful excavations, the city was finally reopened again to the public. Finally, yeah. Just the place you want to go, eh? Every year there's many reports of lootings, locals, tourists, you name it. Everyone wants to steal a little piece of Pompeii. Literally, a little mm, just in their pocket. Yeah, as if raining volcanic ash wasn't bad enough, now there's thousands of people literally stealing your land. Piece by piece. Pompeii archaeological superintendents get over 100 packages a year of said stolen fragments. They return them. Yeah, thieves will send the artifact back with a little note explaining how sorry they are and how it's caused extreme bad luck in the household. Again, might have something to do with the fact that you're a thief, but hey, who knows? <laughs> Maybe it's that one time. That's why your marriage failed. At number seven, trepanation. Trepanation is the process of drilling or scraping a hole into the human skull. Yeah, I know, it doesn't sound fun in the slightest, but back in the olden days, people did it, and it was a relatively common body modification for some reason. This practice was done in all sorts of cultures throughout different periods of time. During the Renaissance, trepanation was used to treat epilepsy and mental disorders, and this practice also dates as far back as the Paleolithic period. In ancient Peru, trepanation was done by using a ceremonial knife called a tumi. In ancient Greece, it was done using a drill. Polynesians used sharpened seashells, and in Europe, the procedure was done by using sharp flint or obsidian. Though we know that in the Renaissance, trepanation was considered a medical practice, in ancient times, the reason for this practice is still uncertain. It could have been used to try and fix damage from head trauma, but it's also believed that this practice was done to heal mental problems, release toxic spirits, or even as some kind of ritual. At number six, neck stretching. In many cultures around the world, having a long neck is considered beautiful, and so many women practice neck stretching in order to attain this level of beauty. The practice of neck stretching is most commonly done by wearing metal rings around the neck, adding more and more rings over time. This practice was first seen in the 11th century in Southeast Asia. The theory behind the rings is that they're so thick that they push the head up, therefore stretching the neck, but in actuality, the lengthening of the neck is caused by the rings pushing down on the collarbones. The origin of this practice is unknown, but it is theorized that it began as a way of making women look more attractive in order to prevent getting captured as slaves. But on the other hand, some believe that this was a way of protecting people from getting attacked by tigers. Though this practice began so long ago, it is still a traditional body modification in some parts of the world. At number five, self-mummification. The process of self-mummification is probably one of the most intense practices of body modification out there, not only because the process is so lengthy, but it also involves passing away at the end of it all. Self-mummification is done by people who practice Shingon Buddhism and is believed to be a way of ascending to a higher spiritual power and gaining immortality. The process of self-mummification is done over the course of 3,000 days. It involves a very strict dietary change, eliminating all cereals, and instead being restricted to eating only nuts, tree bark, resin, pine needles, and berries. 
This diet reduces fat and moisture in the body to avoid bacteria breaking down the body after death. Some people who practice self mummification also drink a tea that is made out of urushi, which makes the person throw up, but also acts as a kind of embalming fluid. Once the person's body is fully prepared, they are buried alive in a small chamber with an air hole, and they would chant and ring a bell to let people know that they're still alive. Once the bell stops ringing, the chamber is fully sealed, and three years later, they're dug up and examined to see if they've been successfully mummified. If they have been, then their body is put on display and worshipped, and if the process was unsuccessful, then they're given an exorcism and reburied. And number 4, Tattoos As we all know, tattoos are still a very prominent part of our culture to this day. But this body modification also has a long history dating as far back as 3300 BCE. The earliest evidence of tattoos comes from Otzi the Iceman, a natural mummy who was found in the Alps who lived thousands of years ago and had a series of small dots and crosses tattooed along his lower spine, knee joints, and ankle joints. Researchers believe that this individual got these tattoos for medicinal reasons to relieve joint pain. In later years, tattoos were seen on more people, showing more intricate designs with different meanings. In ancient Peru, the process of tattooing was done by using cactus spines, dipping them into charcoal and pressing it into the skin. Even some Egyptian mummies showed evidence of tattoos on their bodies. So next time you ask your mom if you can have a tattoo and she says no, tell her about the history of this practice and maybe she'll reconsider. Maybe. At number 3, piercings. Much like tattoos, piercings are still very common in society. I mean, I have a few of them myself. They're in my face. Yeah, but again, much like tattoos, piercings also have a rich history to them. OC the Iceman, who I just mentioned, was not only found with tattoos, but he also had piercings as well. He's starting to sound a little too much like my Tinder matches, honestly. OC had pierced ears, which tells us that this body modification is just as old as tattoos. In the past, piercings were also seen amongst Olmec men in Mesoamerica, and they had plugs put into their cheeks, expanding them as they got bigger. Aztec men also had piercings, sporting lip, nose, and ear plugs, but in this society, your social status dictated what your piercings could be made from. The nobility wore piercings made from gold and precious stones, while lower classes of people had to wear bone. Victories in Warfare also influenced someone's piercings as they would be awarded bigger and bigger lip rings with every success. Even ancient Egyptians wore piercings. King Tut was found to have piercings, however, belly button piercings were very exclusive and were reserved for the pharaoh, and anyone else who had one would be executed. At number two, head shaping. The process of head shaping caused people in modern times to think that aliens were real. When remains were discovered with oddly shaped skulls, people really thought that we had proven the existence of extraterrestrials, but in reality, it actually led to the discovery of an entire practice of human body modification. The process of head shaping involves putting some kind of pressure on a baby's head so that it grows into a different shape. This has been done using cloth or even boards in order to create the desired shape. The earliest evidence of modified skulls comes from Australia and dates back between 14,000 and 9,000 years ago. The skulls that were found had flattened foreheads and very prominent brow ridges. This practice also occurred in South America where skulls with a variety of different shapes were also found. There were a number of different reasons for head shaping among different cultures. Some did it for aesthetics, others did it to protect spirits, but either way, it made for some very interesting looking people. And finally, at number one, knife hand. Now this one is by far the craziest one in my opinion. So you know Captain Hook, right? He's got a hook for a hand. Well, this guy I'm gonna tell you about has Captain Hook beat by a landslide. A sixth century medieval burial was found in Italy and it revealed a male warrior who had a knife for a hand. Yes, this man had a knife instead of a hand. This warrior had a hand amputation, however the reason for said amputation is unknown. In place of the lost hand, the prosthesis was a blade. Now I don't know if this guy lost his hand in battle or something, and the best that they could do was give him a knife as a placeholder, or if he willingly chopped off his hand so that he could have that knife hand, but either way, that is so bad and I would have loved to see this guy in battle. Number 10, the Anguish Man. I don't care who you are, but every family out there has one artifact or one heirloom in their house that just does doesn't sit well with you. Please comment below and let us know. I'm actually very curious to see what it is. For me, it was a dancing Halloween skull with moss and black roses coming out of its eyes, playing the classic funeral song. I don't know what you call it, but you know what I'm talking about. Speaking of funerals, that's probably where the Anguish Man came from. I'm just taking a guess. The Anguish Man is a painting of a man in anguish, or some sort of distress, and I'm not just saying this to be funny, but the painting is 100% bona fide scary. What's more unusual than that is that no one is sure of its origin or creator. The current owner of the painting says he got it from his grandmother, and the knowledge train stops there. No one knows where it came from. Seriously, look at it. It's scary. It's terrifying. I don't like it. 
I'm gonna walk off now, I'm scared. Number nine, the goddess of death statue. Well, that's quite the name. Okay, let's talk about it, shall we? For starters, it doesn't look like anything menacing, which makes the tail that much more convincing, if anything. It looks like one of those crazy bones. Remember crazy bones from the late 90s? So good, I had all of them. Put them in my mouth all the time, weirdly. It's like the suck on some crazy bones. This cursed ancient statue from 3500 BC was unearthed at Lempa, Cyprus back in 1878. The limestone was dated quite a while back, and the statue, as far as origins go, is a complete mystery. But many historians believe that it was once a fertility statue, or it represented a goddess whose name has now been lost in time. The statue has gone through numerous families, with tragedy following closely behind. Hence the, you know, curse aspect of his list. Lord Elephant had the statue for around six years, and during that time, all seven of his family members bit the bullet. Second owner, Ivor Minucci, same thing, entire family just wiped out, this time only within four years. Lord Thompson Noel, entire family, also four years. And then finally, the statue had belonged to the late Sir Alan Biverbrook and his family. And you can probably guess what happened within a few years. Number eight, cursed amethyst. A beautiful purple amethyst stolen from India. Worth a fortune and would make an excellent addition to any jewelry collection. Trouble is, there may be something wrong with this gorgeous gem. Cursed, that is. The first gentleman to appropriate this gem quickly became ill afterwards and passed away. The gem was then given to his son, who also became ill and croaked. The gem kept passing hands as the story goes on, until it came to the possession of a man named Edward Heron Allen, who was so convinced of the gem's dark powers, he stored it in a bank vault and put it in seven lockboxes, just to make sure. It's kind of like the babushka doll from hell. He also left strict instructions to take out the gem 33 years exactly to the day that he put it in, and a warning for anyone who dares possess such an item. It now sits in the Museum of Natural History. I'll keep my distance, thank you very much. Number seven, the pharaohs of Egypt. It was said that any thieves who dare enter or disturb the slumber of the deceased kings shall be cursed and perish. Well, this applies to archeologists too, unfortunately. Howard Carter, the famed archeologist, and his team back in the 1920s had come across the discovery of a lifetime, finding the tomb of King Tutankhamun. You probably heard of him. And kickstarting the study of Egyptology. For anyone in the sciences out there, you know how exciting this is. Trouble is, some folks on Howard Carter's team started to feel a little under the weather. Maybe it was all the excitement from their discovery. Maybe it was the hot African sun and the dry desert, or maybe it was the curse of the Egyptian pharaohs. As some men on his team perished from blood diseases, that's just not okay. So what's the lesson here? Maybe leave these places alone before it starts raining frogs? Huh? Think about it. I don't want that. Number six, the koh i diamond. Another list, another cursed diamond. Here we go, buckle up. The koh i diamond translates to mountain of light in Persian, which sounds beautiful, but all that glitters is not gold. A Hindu legend says those who wear the diamond will own the world, but will also know all its misfortunes. 186 carats, this thing was a pure beauty. Of course, it was passed ruler to ruler, century after century at that point. The earliest account actually is 1628. The diamond was first in the possession of Mughal ruler Shah Jahan. But once his own son had him imprisoned, the diamond later went to Iranian ruler come 1730. Nadir Shah invaded, taking countless lives, as well as the koh i -Noor diamond, all their jewels for that matter, not just the one. It was horrible, but later on, he was taken out by 15 of his own officers while he was asleep. Come the 18th century, Queen Victoria had possession of the diamond after being used in the Treaty of Lahore, but Queen Victoria wasn't a fan of the shape. Yeah, she's like, eh, it doesn't really fit with my gauntlet to snap people away. So she had it recut. So now it's only 105 carats, it's a little smaller, but it's still beautiful. Since then, the diamond has only been worn by British royal women or else we'll explode. Number five, Nazca Lines. Imagine the confusion the first pilots, airmen, or anyone who got a good vantage point in the Peruvian desert, and to their surprise, discover some illustrations in the ground. Except, you know, they're, they're massive and no one knows who the heck drew them. Or at least its origins. Obviously it was done by some sort of ancient tribe or civilization, sure, but the grade school process of thought isn't answered. And if you remember, then you remember. You know what I'm talking about. Your, your five W's. Your who, what, where, when, why, and sometimes how. I almost forgot how to count there. That dyslexia is a heck of a thing. I mean, I know how they dug these bad boys in the sand, but hear me out. In those times, there's no planes. The only way you'd be able to see them is on the surrounding foothills. But there's no evidence that these people live close to those drawings, so who were they made for? Gods? Extraterrestrials? The weird guy with the weird hair on the History Channel would tell you so. All I'm gonna say is, 
Anything that's meant for gods and aliens, they meant for us. So keep keep an eye out in space there. Keep an eye out. Number four, ballista balls. I'm not sure if you picked this up yet, but uh, don't take things that don't belong to you. Great, hit the, hit the thumbs up for that common knowledge we should all have. Whether you believe in curses or not, leave things alone, and people for that matter, okay? If you want to learn more about Roman artillery, that's why we're here. Don't steal 6th century weaponry, ever. It's a bad idea. Back in 1989, an archaeological team was brushing up the past near Israeli-Syrian borders, and the remains of an ancient Roman ballista, a massive crossbow, were found. It's exciting, but here comes the bad stuff. Six years later, researchers found ballista balls, which were sadly the ammo when it came to these massive war machines. And in 2015, these balls appeared in a courtyard outside of a museum in Israel, written from an anonymous thief, imploring others to never touch those stone balls or take them. As, you know, they're, they're cursed. They're all cursed, apparently, full of bad luck. His family apparently left him, this thief, and he had to sell everything he possessed in order to just get by, including those ballista balls. He was gonna sell them and he's like, you know what, no, that's the last thing I own, I'm putting it back. Could be a curse, again, or the fact that he was the thief. Either or, both not great. Number three, Montezuma's Revenge. Yes, that's right, Montezuma's Revenge, a traveler's worst nightmare. I too have succumbed to the horrors of Montezuma's Revenge. And it's always when I gotta do something important, like on a movie set, or with a group of people I'm really trying to impress, especially career-wise. So the rule is that no pickled bocconcini peppers before a critical event. However, I'm talking about a different kind of Montezuma's revenge, not the bathroom kind. I'm talking about his gold. I'm talking about when Hernan Cortez and the conquistadors destroyed the Aztec Empire. Montezuma cursed them. And that applies to his lost gold as well. Which in case you didn't know, the Spanish were after. It's pretty much all they were after. So if Montezuma can curse your family trip to Cancun, then surely he can curse a pile of his own gold and jewels. After some were dumped in the lake and others in the desert. I just wouldn't exactly be so excited to go find it. You don't know what, I'm, what might happen if you do. If he can give you diarrhea, maybe he can give you vomiting. You don't know. You don't know. I'm pointing a lot in this video. And number two, ancient mirror. It doesn't matter who you are, you've heard of this curse before. Maybe you have it. Maybe you're experiencing this curse right now, I hope not. You break a mirror and what do you get? You get seven years of bad luck. Has this happened to you ever? If so, what year are you on? I'm on four myself. How close are you to the seven year mark? Cause we got your back, okay? Ancient Romans believed that the human soul would renew every seven years. That's where the seven year thing comes into play. It's where it all started. It takes time to repair the human soul, right? Combined with the belief that mirror's reflection was the only way into the soul, well, now we have one dude in history who feels really bad for breaking the first ever mirror. Therefore, a curse has lived on. If you break a mirror, you're tearing the soul from the body and now you're abandoning it. In Kazakhstan, if you break a mirror, evil spirits will haunt the person responsible for the damage. That's a pretty horrible deal. They say you can't look into a broken mirror afterwards, like once it shatters into a bunch of pieces, because that's bad luck as well. So if you break a mirror, you just gotta do nothing about it, I guess. You just gotta be like, ah, okay, and sweep without looking. There's too many mirrors now, I can like, cut to today. I'm sure ancient Romans had no idea what 2022 would look like. We have phone cases with mirrors on them. We're literally surrounded by mirrors. I broke a studio mirror, a dance studio mirror once. Am I doomed? I feel like I'm doomed. Number one, vampire burial. If you couldn't tell, I get a lot of my knowledge from movies, TV, and video games. It's just what raised me, that's how it goes. So you can't blame me when my knowledge of vampires comes from Skyrim and the hit young adult romance novels Twilight. You know what I'm saying? However, what I do know is that they have sharp teeth, they don't like garlic, and will cease to exist if you drive a wooden stake through their heart. However, that's kind of a moot point, as most things would not work anymore if you did that. I know I wouldn't. Some folks in Poland a few hundred years ago were not taking any chances, however. Remains found in Caldas, Poland, were that of anti-vampire graves. Basically, you bury the vampires and you leave a wooden stake in their heart just in case it wants to wake up and eat you or do whatever they do at night. I don't know, blah, 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 some of that stuff. Or remove their head entirely. No wooden stake, no problem. Just toss a couple small boulders into the hole. That way, the bloodthirsty menace can't get people. You know, boy, people in the past were so kind. That's so nice. On number 10, the Scylla. Even though the Scylla Kingdom was one of the longest standing royal dynasties ever, not many people know about it because very few traces of their existence have been left behind. The Scylla ruled most of the Korean peninsula between 57 BCE and 935 CE, but again, not much is known about them. Very few burial sites have been found and the majority of what's been recovered by researchers are various treasures such as ornate jewelry and weapons. One set of remains that was discovered by archaeologists did however give 
scientists a bit of a glimpse into the life of the Scylla. The remains of a woman estimated to be in her early 30s was found, and from what scientists discovered, they know that she was likely a vegetarian and that she had an elongated skull, which may suggest that the Scylla could have practiced body modifications in their society, but nothing can be confirmed. The story of how the Scylla came to be comes from legend. It was said that the Scylla was founded by a man that was hatched from a mysterious egg in the forest and married a queen who was born from the ribs of a dragon. Knowing this legend, it's not surprising to find out that this society was very aristocratic. If your founder was hatched from an egg and married a queen, then there's gotta be some kind of hierarchy going on. At number nine, the Indus. The Indus is the largest known ancient urban culture, and they did some pretty impressive things too. Stretching from the Indus River in modern day Pakistan to the Arabian Sea and the Ganges in India, this ancient metropolis thrived from 3300 BCE to 1600 BCE. The Indus were quite innovative for their time, having created sewage and drainage systems for their large city. They also built huge walls and granaries, and they invested their time in arts by creating pottery and glazed beads, and they even had dental care. Scientists actually found the remains of a number of people who showed signs of having received dental work on their molars between 7,500 and 9,000 years ago. Things seem to have been going pretty well for these people, but eventually they had to leave their dwellings behind. And it is theorized that this happened because climate change started to affect the monsoonal rains in the area, and this in turn dried up most of their land. And obviously that isn't good for agriculture, and so they fled and went elsewhere. Before we continue learning about more ancient people, I would like to first take a moment to ask you guys to leave a like on this video if you're enjoying it so far, and maybe even subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. We would love to have you as part of the Bumblebee family, so smash that subscribe button and join the hive. At number eight, the Sang Sing Dui. This Bronze Age culture is believed to have lived in what is now China's Sichuan province. First evidence of this group of people was first discovered in the late 1920s, but despite efforts of archaeologists and researchers, not much is known about this ancient tribe. What we do know about them is that the Sang Sing Dui were a very artistic group. Based on some of the artwork found by researchers, this group of ancient people were prolific makers of bronze and gold foil masks. Some scientists believe that these masks may have represented certain gods in their culture or even ancestors. No one really knows what happened to this group of people though. There is evidence that the Sang Sing Dui abandoned their homes 2800 to 3000 years ago and may have moved to a neighboring province, but more research is needed to prove this. As for why they may have relocated, some researchers believe that perhaps there was an earthquake or even a landslide that caused people to flee. Number seven, the baker's wedding dress. Why is it in so many horror films the ghost is always a lady floating around in a white wedding dress? Mix it up a little, I don't know. Maybe a bridesmaid's gown wouldn't hurt. Maybe something red, some little pizzazz on it, I don't know. Been watching a lot of RuPaul's Drag Race. Throw, a, throw, throw some glitter on something, I don't know. They're always taken out before their wedding night, it seems. Or apparently they're taken out over a vase. Back in 1849 in the small town of Atuna, Pennsylvania, Elliot Baker and his wife Hetty lived in the Baker Mansion. They had two sons, one daughter, and a baker. Anna had fallen in love with one of her father's employees, another steel worker, but her father wouldn't allow the relationship to really, you know, take off. Anna vowed to never marry again and she locked herself in her room. When her father passed away in 1848, she went to go find her true love, but he had since settled down. So she spent the rest of her days behaving erratically. You know, she was upset, rightfully so. Her father didn't let her have her true love. And now her soul still haunts that same wedding dress today. Not just the dress too, the mansion is haunted as well. And guests would report furniture and vases moving around all the time. That's not bad as far as hauntings go. You ask me, moving couches? That'd be great, I have a bad back. I would love some help, really, thank you. Anna, grab the side, let's go, one, two, three. Number six, the crying boy. Another painting, I know, but this one is extra creepy. So basically, there's this very popular print of a painting. It's a boy, he's crying. Oh, I know, who would want that though, seriously. There's different versions of it, but originally done by Bruno Armilio. Well, we don't talk about Bruno because his painting had some serious creep factor going on. Besides the fact that it's a crying young man who's peering into the very depths of your soul, firefighters began to notice a pattern when putting out house fires. There's a connection here, hold on, stay tuned. No smoke alarms, leaving the stove unattended, and this painting were common. I wonder why, except the painting was never damaged in any of these fires. And after putting out a few houses, and the same painting keeps showing up and keeps surviving the said fires, that's strange, hmm, that's weird. As it turns out, the print had flame retardant chemicals in its production, thus protecting it. Maybe just don't bring it inside though. Number five, the Hope Diamond. Coming from the 1660s, this curse began when a gem dealer named Jean-Baptiste Tavernier 
bought this large diamond when visiting India. He bought it with his, with his earned money, with his money, okay? Remember that. The origins of the diamond were unknown, but it didn't matter. This beauty was just sitting there and he had to throw all the cash at it. He had to buy it with all of his money. For sure, the money that he had. Well, later on, after Tavernier got the diamond, rumors spread throughout Europe and the United States that he actually stole the diamond from the statue of a Hindu goddess. He didn't actually buy it. Yeah, little different than his story. Sadly, more believable too. The newspapers actually kicked this one off by publishing the Hope Diamond as an ancient curse. The diamond at one point ended up in the hands of King Louis XVI and his wife, Marie Antoinette. Well, if you don't know about them, they were, uh, they lost their, you know, they died. They lost their lives during the French Revolution, let's just say that. The old guillotine dream team. The stone then went to Lord Francis Hope come 1839. By that point, it was deemed cursed for real, hence the Hope Diamond name. They ended up selling the diamond shortly after being reduced to poverty, and then Evelyn Walsh McLean bought the stone in 1912. Shortly after, her son was killed in a car accident, and when the stone was delivered to its final and current home, the Smithsonian, back in 1958, the driver delivering the package was later hit by a truck. He survived, but shortly after this, his house caught fire. Moral of the story, you don't need diamonds for more reasons than one. Number four, crude oil. Before anyone jumps all over me and says, but Chetty, I love crude oil because it provides jobs and economy. That's true, you're right, and there's probably gonna be someone else saying that without crude oil and gasoline, how can they keep up their lifestyle? I need gas for my sedan, pickup truck, SUV, RV, dirt bike, quad bike, go-kart, speedboat, my John Deere, lawn equipment. All this is true, and as a big dude, I appreciate the automobile just as much as the next guy. I ain't walking. However, one cannot deny the amount of trouble oil has caused folks in the last 100 years. Name a place with oil and there's probably someone foaming at the mouth trying to get their hands on it. You can go either way on this one, really. All I know is that I'm not the emperor of an evil empire looking for oil. Or am I? Number three, the Busby Stoop Chair. The Busby Stoop Chair comes from 1702. So right off the bat, this legend kicked off only 10 years after the Salem Witch Trials. So take this one with a grain of salt, please. People made odd choices at this time. They kind of believed anything, you know, women were witches, chairs were haunted. Welcome to 1702, I guess. Englishman Thomas Busby had some issues with his father-in-law. He didn't handle those issues well and he had to be hanged for it. Yeah, you can't just kill people for no reason, Thomas. What is it, 1701? That's crazy. He was hanged near the Humble Inn, ironic name, but a chair that was nearby during said hanging is now said to hold the spirit of one Thomas Busby. So legend has it, if you sit on this chair or if you put your knee on it or whatever, you are set to die in a frightful accident. A frightful accident, big chair, could you imagine? You sat in that chair, now you're gonna your pants at work. No! That's it. God forbid you needed to tie your shoelace at the Humble Inn. Oh, the horrors, the horrors. So the chair was declared haunted. The chair was declared haunted. But did anything actually happen afterwards? Yeah, honestly. Sounds silly, but this was the real deal, I guess. Locals say during World War II, airmen from a nearby base came to the pub and those who sat in the Busby chair have never returned. Again, could have had something to do with the war, but let's continue. Then in the late 70s, more accidents were connected, but they still kept the chair around until 1798. They're like, eh, it's haunted, but it looks nice, you know? It matches the wall. It stayed at the inn for that long, and then it was donated to the Thirsk Museum. So if you feel like checking out some haunted chairs, there you go, freaks. Number two, Capuchin Crypt. Hey, I get it. In the past, there were no home renovators. You couldn't walk into your favorite big box home renovation store and pick out some great additions for interior design. Well, some guys in Rome thought their church was a little underwhelming. They wanted something that made a statement, something bold, something macabre. The Church of Santa Maria in Rome, and it has a longer name, but it's not dyslexia friendly, so I'm not gonna pronounce it, is a church that's decorated with skulls and bones arranged in tasteful art pieces, lining the walls and archways with bones look like designs, and one room having some mummified monks and a wall full of skulls to comfort, Churchgoers, oh god. I can just imagine what a room full of old bones smells like. Oh, no thank you. Oh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be sick. Oh. And number one, the Great Bed of Ware. Yeah, let's get nice and cozy for this last one. When putting this list together, Big Chet and I both agreed that Haunted or Not, this is a bed we would both have, for sure. It's massive, it's cozy, it caught our eye. It looks like a bed a king would sleep in, and rightfully so. The Great Bed of Ware was built for the royal family back in 1463. It was 12 feet by 12 feet, plenty of space to 
cut your toenails, whatever you want to do. Yeah, just brush them off. You got like 11 more feet to work with. You're good. It's a big bed. What a time. Jonas Fosbrook, a carpenter from the time, impressed King Edward IV with his work. The king gave him a pension for life all because of this bed. That's how good it was. Over time, the bed became property of the Lord of Ware Manor, a man named Thomas Fanshawe. People would travel all across the land to see this beauty. That's a fun family vacation. Hey, let's go see this bed. I heard it's a neat bed. Pack your stuff. Shakespeare mentioned it in the Twelfth Night, it was a big deal, but all those who stayed in the bed did not have a good night's rest. Rather, they woke up to scratches and bruises, it was horrible. That is, if they got enough sleep to begin with. People would wake up on the floor. Somehow they would roll out of a 12-foot bed. That's crazy. Today it can be found in the Victoria and Albert Museum, so if you want to go cuddle up, there you go. At number 10, First Americans. 2021 brought us a lot of new discoveries. The study of ancient humans gained more information with the discoveries made last year. One of the bizarre finds from last year include footprints that are believed to have belonged to some of the first people to set foot in America. These footprints were discovered in muddy earth at the edge of a wetland in New Mexico and were very well preserved. After some research was done, it was found that these footprints were made somewhere between 21,000 and 23,000 years ago, which greatly pushes back the timeline of when humans came to the Americas, the last continent to be settled by humans. Up until this point, it was believed that the first humans arrived in the Americas around 13,000 years ago, at the end of the last ice age. These footprints, which are believed to have been made by children have scientists thinking that these humans migrated to the area during a time where sheets of ice blocked the passage to North America, indicating that they were there much earlier than previously thought. At number 9, Dragon Man. Now, even though the name might not suggest it, no, this is not a half man, half dragon, but it's still a strange discovery. This past summer, scientists discovered the skull of this new human species that they've named Homo longi. Longi being the Chinese name for dragon, and dragon being a reference to the location that these remains were found since they were discovered by the Dragon River region in northeast China. The skull of the dragon man dates back 146,000 years, and scientists believe that this new species belongs to another sister group of the Homo sapiens, so they're even more closely related to us than Neanderthals. What stunned researchers the most about this incredible find was the size of this being's skull because it was pretty big for a hominid from this time. This find opened a new avenue of discoveries for scientists, so that's exciting news for anyone who takes an interest in this sort of thing. I mean, with further research, who knows what we could learn from this find. Before we carry on talking about some more of these strange discoveries, why not take a moment to leave a like on this video if you're enjoying it so far, and while you're at it, consider subscribing to the channel to see more videos like this one. At number 8, Ancient Fashion. In 2021, archaeologists made a discovery that gives us an idea of how ancient humans made clothing. It was always assumed that ancient humans used animal furs for clothing, but up until recently, not much was known about their fashion. With this newest find, scientists were able to figure out how clothing was made all those thousands of years ago. 62 bone tools were found in Morocco, and it's believed that they were used to process and smooth animal skins. This find may be the earliest evidence for clothing in the archaeological records. The bone tools that were found are believed to be between 90,000 and 120,000 years old and were used to work leather. What's fascinating about this find is the fact that similar bone tools are still used by leather workers even to this day, so it's cool to know that our ways haven't changed much over the years. At number 7, the knock. The Nok tribe from what is now northern Nigeria lasted from 1000 BCE to 300 BCE and was a very mysterious culture that was actually discovered by complete accident. Tin miners happened to find ancient artifacts, including a terracotta head, during a mining operation in 1943. This discovery began a larger excavation expedition in the area, and they have since found plenty of other terracotta artifacts and sculptures, including depictions of people wearing jewelry and carrying weapons like batons and flails. Some of their sculptures also depicted people with diseases like elephantitis. Knock artifacts have a history of being stolen or removed from archaeological sites without notice, which has some researchers wondering what, other than their historical significance, makes them so prone to thefts. There is for sure a mystery there. At number 6, the Etrusians. In northern Italy, between 700 BCE and 500 BCE, there lived an ancient society of people called the Estrusians. This group of people were a thriving theocratic society, that is, before they were eventually absorbed into the Roman Republic. The Estrusians had their own written language and left behind a number of luxurious family tombs as well. As I mentioned, 
mentioned, this society was theocratic as the artifacts they left behind suggest that religion and rituals were a big part of their daily lives. Among some of the artifacts that have been discovered by researchers include the earliest depictions of childbirth in Western art, and even a number of sandstone slabs that have been engraved with ancient Etruscan text. The archaeological sites where researchers continue to uncover the secrets of this ancient populace have revealed over 25,000 artifacts, and scientists continue to uncover more each day. At number 5, the land of Punt. One of the most mysterious ancient tribes that you might not have known about are the people of the land of Punt. Many of the ancient cultures that we know about today we've learned through ancient texts, and this is basically the case with the land of Punt. We only know about them through Egyptian records. What we do know about the ancient land of Punt is that it was a kingdom somewhere in Africa that regularly made trades with ancient Egyptians. The land of Punt and the ancient Egyptians were trading goods from at least the 26th century BCE during the reign of Pharaoh Khufu, who was also known as the builder of the Great Pyramids of Giza. Now, even though we know that the land of Punt traded with ancient Egyptians, we don't know exactly where these people were located. The Egyptians kept record of the goods that were being traded with the land of Punt, like gold, ebony, and myrrh, but they didn't exactly keep record of where where these goods were being sent, which has researchers frustrated because they can only hypothesize where these goods may have been sent. Some researchers believe that perhaps the land of Punt was located somewhere in Arabia or perhaps on the Horn of Africa or maybe somewhere down the Nile River that is now southern Sudan and Ethiopia. I honestly hope that one day the location of the land of Punt is found because there could be so many amazing finds waiting to be discovered. At number 4, the Bell Beakers. Here's yet another mysterious ancient tribe that you might not have known about. The Bell Beakers are such a mystery that researchers base their name on the only artifacts that have ever been found from these ancient people. The Bell Beakers are known for their pottery that looks like upside down bells, hence the name. These ancient people are believed to have lived across Europe between 2800 BCE and 1800 BCE. Other than their distinctive bell beakers, this ancient tribe also left behind copper artifacts as well as burial sites. An ancient bell beaker cemetery containing 154 graves was found in what is now modern day Czech Republic. Some researchers believe that the bell beakers may have also been responsible for the construction of part of Stonehenge. There are still many unanswered questions about the bell beakers, but until scientists find more evidence, this is all the information that we have on them for now. At number three, the Danubians. The Danubians were an ancient civilization who thrived near the Balkan foothills and the lower Danube Valley between 5500 BCE and 3500 BCE. Over the course of 1500 years, the Danubians became one of the most advanced societies at this time. They were best known for their work with terracotta, more specifically their creation of goddess figurines. Though they are impressive pieces, the purpose of these figurines remains unknown to researchers, but many speculate that they were used to celebrate the strength of women in their culture. The Danubians were also known to cast gold into graves, and they seem to have taken this very seriously since one of the cemeteries they found had a collection of around 3,000 pieces of gold. Though they were very impressive for their time, they later just seemed to have vanished or died off. But researchers have yet to piece together exactly what happened to these ancient people. At number two, the Jiahu. Before the rise of China's great dynasties, smaller tribes covered the area, each with their own unique cultures. One of the oldest of these ancient tribes were the Jiahu, and they were located in what is now modern-day Hainan province in eastern China. The Jiahu were China's first identifiable civilization, and they thrived between 7000 BCE and 5700 BCE. The artifacts that researchers were able to recover from this 9,000-year-old civilization contain things like the world's earliest wine, the oldest working musical instruments, such as flutes made from the bone of birds, some of the oldest preserved rice, as well as the earliest samples of Chinese writing. As for what happened to the Jiahu people, researchers believe that they migrated elsewhere due to flooding from the nearby rivers. And finally, at number one, Ain Ghazal. Located in what is now modern-day Jordan, Ain Ghazal was a Neolithic society that boomed during the transition between hunter-gatherer tribes and established civilizations. This ancient society started off with roughly 3,000 people as they came together to create their unique culture, and they also began to develop impressive artwork that decorated their metropolis. Things like plaster figurines of pregnant women and other stylized human figures were found to have adorned their cities. Archaeologists found evidence of this society's transition to farming and agriculture, noting their heavy use of 
of goat herds and vegetable storage. Though the Ingazol society was booming and growing, researchers have noticed groups of people packed up in a hurry and deserted their settlements with over 90% of the population migrating elsewhere. No one quite knows what prompted so many people to leave the area, but it's most likely that they migrated to other established societies, leaving behind their transitional city for something more modern for their time. Now before I wrap things up for you guys today, I want you guys to tell me down below in the comments which of these ancient tribes I talked about today have you never heard of until now? Was it just a few of them? Maybe all of them? Let me know down below. Number 10. Sacred books. The Romans paved the way for many following civilizations, okay? They invented surgical tools, they invented medicine on the battlefield, and before this era, literature took the form of a tablet or a scroll. The Romans, they created the codex. Pages stacked on top of one another, just bound pages. The reason you have homework right now to be doing instead of watching this. It's all thanks to the ancient Romans. The early codex was bound wax, and then it moved to animal skin. This was a big step because early Christians used this new invention to produce copies of the Bible. Important pieces of history, so rightfully so, they had to be locked away from the public. Now back when King Tarkin ruled Rome, a local woman offered the Etruscan king nine books. Now these books were ignored at first, but upon a second glance, the beat up manuscripts foretold the rise and fall of Rome. So for most of its time, these spoiler filled manuscripts were held in the temple of Jupiter. So if anybody wants to do National Treasure 3, I have some ideas, just saying. We could do like nine installments. Number nine, corrupt fire department. Oh, here we go. When we think back to ancient times, it's not long before we come across an ancient blaze or some ancient wild tragedy where you're like, oh my God, how did that even happen? Something that reminds you that it wasn't always a party, okay? It was rarely a party, in fact. When we think of Julius Caesar when regarding the leadership of Rome, we often forget Marcus Crassus. He was powerful and full of bright ideas on the sidelines. Marcus ran the fire brigade. A lot of open fires, a lot of accidents happened happening at this time, so of course we need responders. But back then, these officials arrived on site to this blazing emergency, but before helping out, Crossus would demand the owner sells their property to him first. Yeah, watch it burn or sell it for a not so handsome price. The choice is yours. And also you have 38 seconds to decide. TikTok. Number eight, ancient drag. I'll respect a girl's night out, okay? Always, I get it. My guy friends have ruined most nights out that I've had in the city. Cause guys are dumb asses. That's a fact. Ancient Romans were ahead of the game with this one as well. That's why they made the festival of the good goddess women only. Yeah, statues of men weren't even allowed to partake. Statues depicting men at this festival had to be draped. Yeah, none of us were seeing anything. But then in comes Mr. Jealous, Mr. Ancient FOMO himself. Enter Publius Clodius Pulcher, okay? This man disguised himself as a flute lady, but when he didn't play the flute, and also wasn't a lady, and also nobody knew him, it was a little obvious that an intruder was present. A trial soon followed and the festival was then suspended. See, guys ruin the party, even in ancient Roman days. This dude's like, nah, I'm gonna go ruin it. At number seven, Gobekli Tepe. The Neolithic era was the final period of the Stone Age where early humans began the process of domestication of animals and agriculture. For a long time, scientists believed that this era gave way to the process of holding rituals and creating monuments to their beliefs. But with the remarkable discovery of Gobekli Tepe, that entire idea was rewritten as this mysterious site suggested that early hunter-gatherers made this temple as a ritualistic center far before these individuals decided to create settlements and begin the agricultural revolution. Based on evidence found at this site that dates 6,000 years older than Stonehenge, groups of hunter-gatherers came to this site in Urfa, Turkey some 11,500 years ago and carved out this ritualistic site out of the limestone that covered the area. It is believed that Gobekli Tepe was just a stopping point for these early humans. It was a place to meet, hold feasts, and then leave again. Soon enough though, the desire to regularly hold these gatherings prompted the early humans to domesticate plants and animals to have a more dependable food source. So with this in mind, it is believed that these rituals are what gave way to the agricultural revolution, not the other way around. If you've seen any content regarding Gobekli Tepe, then you would know how eerie and mysterious this site looks, and because it's so old, it holds so many secrets that we have yet to uncover. At number 6, Cave Paintings I think that out of all the things left behind by our ancient ancestors, cave paintings are one of the most bizarre. So many archaic art pieces have been found by scientists over the years, from statues to ceremonial pieces, but cave paintings are by far the most fascinating, at least in my opinion. Much like modern art, it is all up to interpretation, especially since the artists who created these cave masterpieces are long gone. Some of the most mysterious cave paintings are those that depict some kind of alien life forms. 
Yep, I said aliens. Even back in the days of the early humans, Homo sapiens have been looking to the stars or even having their own encounters with extraterrestrials. One such depiction of alien life comes from the Wangina cave paintings. These eerie looking paintings depict these sky beings, as they were called. These beings are depicted with white faces, devoid of a mouth, large black eyes, and a head surrounded by a halo or some kind of helmet. According to legend, the Wangina were sky people or spirits from the sky who descended from the Milky Way and created Earth and all of its inhabitants. The Wangina realized how big a task their creation was, and so they sent for more of their people and spent their time creating, teaching, and being gods to the people of Earth. Eventually, they left, either descending into the water or returning back into the stars. This extraterrestrial discovery has to be one of the most bizarre finds from our ancient ancestors. At number five, mass extinction. This one might be a little sad because we're going to talk about how scientists determined just how much destruction humans caused in the early days of humanity. While humans were evolving in Africa, the rest of the world's creatures were thriving for the most part. In many parts of the world untouched by human influence, there were megafauna. These megafauna were able to live and thrive for thousands of years, at least until Homo sapiens came along and ruined everything. As we started to traverse the globe, creating settlements and beginning the story of humanity, we we also, in the process, killed off most of this megafauna, causing a mass extinction of these creatures. This extinction event, which scientists have called the Holocene extinction, is still ongoing. Most of the largest animals to have ever roamed the Earth were wiped out around 80,000 years ago and went completely extinct by 10,000 years ago. Some scientists want to blame this on climate change, however, in a lot of places, the timing of the first human settlements and the extinction of certain animals line up too precisely to completely excuse us from having caused damage to Earth's megafauna. At number four, baby burial. Though it can be really sad, finding ancient burial sites can give researchers a lot of information about the culture of certain groups of ancient people. At a 34,000 year old hunter gatherer burial site near Moscow, archaeologists discovered the remains of two adolescent boys, and what they found alongside the remains was surprising. These two boys, who looked to have had some kind of disability, were buried like royalty. They were buried together, along with 10,000 mammoth beads, more than 20 armbands, around 300 pierced fox teeth. 16 ivory mammoth spears, carvings, antlers, and human fibula laid across the chest of each child. Compared to the other adult burial sites, this one was quite lavish, but the reason as to why these two were buried with so much care is unknown. It is one of those mysteries from our history that remains unsolved, making it a bit of a bizarre find. At number three, Old Settlement. In an area of Kenya called Panga Ya Saidi, archaeologists discovered a network of caves that are believed to have housed hundreds of people. This cave area houses more than a thousand square feet of space, and it is believed that an ancient tribe used to call this place home. Inside this cave, archaeologists also discovered a collection of various stone tools that date back around 67,000 years. This was the ideal living arrangement for the ancient people who used to live there because the tropical climate of the area would have been good for survival, whereas other areas of Africa would have experienced drought. This discovery just helped further our understanding of how the early humans lived. At number two, Homo floresiensis. Here's a really interesting species of human that has recently been discovered. Homo floresiensis, nicknamed the Hobbit, were ancient hominids who lived in Indonesia around 100,000 to 50,000 years ago, and as you could probably guess by its nickname, these ancient humans were very small. It is estimated that they only stood about 3 foot 6 on average and weighed just over 60 pounds. Homo floresiensis also had tiny brains, large teeth, shrugged forward shoulders, had no chins, and had receding foreheads. So they definitely did not look like the rest of us humans. So far, Far, the remains of these humans have only been found on the island of Flores, Indonesia, and because of that, scientists believe that this species of human was subjected to island dwarfism, an evolutionary process that occurs from long-term isolation on an island with limited food. This island also has pygmy elephants, who are also extinct. What's pretty cool though is that scientists are currently exploring new evidence that might suggest that Homo floresiensis might have already been small before arriving to the island. And finally at number one, ancient music. 
When you think about ancient humans, you might not associate them with art or music as they were quite primitive, but it turns out that some of our human ancestors were quite musically inclined. Years back, scientists discovered the first evidence of musical instruments in Germany and Slovakia. In 2008, archaeologists in Germany found flutes made from mammoth ivory that date back around 40,000 years ago, and just a few years before that, in 1995 in Slovakia, researchers found other flutes made from the thigh bones of cave bears which dated back around 60,000 years. The Slovakian flutes were the oldest musical instruments ever found, and they were made by Neanderthals. This opened up a whole new world of discovery for scientists, as this find suggested that these ancient people were able to comprehend concepts like rhythm, tempo, and melody. This also suggested that Neanderthals were much more intelligent and sophisticated than we thought.